And we're live. Welcome to the Eat Well Move Well radio show. Welcome to um, the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast. My guest today, Nick Caldwell. Nick, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you on. Thank you for joining the show. Thanks for having me. Look, for those that don't know Nick, I'll try and um, uh, pay him the, the right kind of respect with his intro here. Uh, Nick, like me, spent uh, many years in the military. Um, so we've got your, your profile here. You know, 12 years total military uh, experience, four years uh, in the commando regiments, six years in the uh, SASR, for those that don't know, especially a service regiment uh, for Australia. But you're also the co-founder and creator of the Mill Gym. Um, Nick, I'd, I'd really like to share your story. Uh, I'd, I'd heard about your many heard about your gym many years ago. I'll, I'll fill you on on that one. And uh, it was great to meet you and, and get instructed by you um, uh, a few months back. And uh, I know we've got some um, some friends in common. But can we talk about your path to the military, perhaps, and then we'll 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 lead on to everything else um, uh, that you've been through with your journey. Okay, yeah. So I, I grew up in uh, Queensland, uh, basically from where I am. It's absolutely the outside of the country from where I live now. But I grew up in a rural area north of Brisbane. And uh, in that area, there was basically pineapple farms, cattle, horse adjustments. That's about it. Now, now it's a completely different space. Like you go there now, it's all developed into residential. But this is like, this is probably about 35 years ago now. So it's a completely different area than what it is now. And basically when I grew up, uh, all we did was spend a lot of time outside. So I was very fortunate to have a motorbike, you know, have a, a ute around the farm that we could drive around from a very early age, um, shooting, did a lot of shooting, duck hunting, fox hunting, all those sorts of things. Uh, so all I wanted to do basically was continue on with that. I just wanted to find a lifestyle and a profession which would enable me to continue on with that lifestyle and profession. Uh, so yeah, the army seemed like the logical choice to me. And I decided that I wanted to join the army quite young. So I was about 10 when I decided that that was the career I wanted to take. And, and it was really basically because I saw the movie Commando and the movie Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger came out about 1985, 1986. And that was like, that's it. That's the clincher. That's, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to do. And obviously it's a romanticized view of the military. You know, you can't go into the military and become a commando and, you know, take on a thousand people and survive with just a scratch on your arm or a cool scratch on your face, something like that. Basically it's obviously a different story, but, that got me on the path. Um, and I think that's that's why it's important that we we get this information and things like that out there. And all these movies that come out that, that are, are basically modelled on or getting getting consulting from operators who've been on the, on the job, they give people a realistic understanding of what the job's like. So for me, Hollywood was a big, was a really big contributor to me wanting to uh, join the army. Oh, that's really cool. I remember where I was when I saw Commando. I was um, seventh form, so I was 17 years old last year of high school. And our lecture theatre had a um, a study hour. <laughs> we we oh, all yeah, we were in there watching Commando. What an interesting <laughs> uh, what an interesting uh, way in. What how old were you when you joined? I was oh, so I was I was nineteen when I joined. I wanted to join uh, in so I didn't want to do senior high school basically. Uh, but my parents were you know smart enough not to sign off me on being a boy soldier join the army, and they made me they, well they didn't make me they advised me to go to do some university studies just in case the army didn't pan out. Obviously it's pretty hard, pretty difficult to pass commando, let alone SAS selection. So their methodology was to have a backup plan. And the backup plan was effectively to get some sort of education and go into a career after that. So to me, um, the military was the prime goal, but the secondary goal or the alternate was to become a secret agent. <laughs> so when I studied, when I went to university, that was the intent that I would study subjects that would enable me to work for, you know, a, a DFAT or ASIS or ASIO or something like that, should I fail um, selection for special forces. Um, and, you know, obviously there is a process to get through to pass to go into those organisations as well. But, you know, in terms of me positioning myself, I thought I was doing the right thing in terms of doing my own physical training making sure I studied hard, and then making sure I put myself in the best position to pass um, selection should the opportunity come up. It was probably about a year and a half into university that as a reservist, I got the opportunity to do commando selection. And uh, so, yeah, why not? I'll have a crack. And I trained up for it, did commando selection, got selected, and that's all she wrote. Basically, I transferred from the reserve to the full-time commandos. 
uh, within six months. And, and that's where my career started. What an interesting way looking back. Isn't hindsight amazing? You know, you literally train through the Milgin um, people for selections, um, albeit for SASR, Commando, TRG, all those things. Um, now you know, that's, you, that's your skill set. Looking back at your preparation to, to do that for yourself, obviously it worked. Um, what sort of changed now from what you did with your own training, your own mindset? Obviously, you're very driven. Um, to what you're teaching people now? Well, basically, we, we had far less information back then. So the internet wasn't a thing. Uh, as you know, like it started very, very late in our, in our lives in terms of, you know, I think we were, I was in my probably about 15 or 16 when I first heard about the internet. Um, and the access to information still wasn't there, especially if you didn't have a computer. You know, we were fortunate enough to have a computer later on, but, you know, we definitely didn't have smartphones. We definitely didn't have tablets. You know, we definitely didn't have any means to get um, as much information as we can get today. And so a lot of the time it was basically about feeling around in the dark. And I think the first guidance for me in terms of how to train was Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. And <laughs> as, a, as, a, as, a, as a guy preparing for selection, that's all the information I had. And obviously it is not, a, not the ideal means to prepare for selection, to follow a book like that. But that's all I had. It was a hard, it was a uh, soft cover, large book, and it's full of information about training and and um, isolating particular muscle groups, all that sort of thing. And so that's what I, that's all I had. That's all the information I had. And as I went along, I kept collecting more and more books, and mainly written by X twenty two SAS guys, mm. and talking about their preparation and what they did, and what the selection was like for them. And so putting that into the little hopper and and coming out with ways to make sure that I get, you know, do the right training to ensure that I will like, at least increase my chances of ensuring of, of passing selection. As you go along this journey, you know, reading as much as I possibly could, speaking to as many people as I possibly could, the commando selection uh, was uh, was one of those things where I just took a stab in the dark, threw a dart with my eyes closed at the dartboard and hoping it's going to hit the bullseye. And hopefully I'm training in the right means. And I was fortunate enough that I at least had the physical physicality to finish the course let alone get selected. So I was pretty happy about that. But even that was a learning experience in itself. And then as we went through that process further on with commanders, there were some commanders there who attempted SAS selection. And some had passed, but chose to get posted back to Sydney for whatever reason. And so they became the font of knowledge. And as we went along, we started getting, I got deployed to my first deployment in commandos to East Timor. And we're very fortunate to have a very experienced um, SAS sniper who left the regiment to work at his family business and came on as a part-time commando. So he became the font of knowledge. And, and I just kept getting channeled, channeled into more specific, more relevant training um, processes or protocols. And by the time we got to selection, I basically did selection with my whole sample recon team from commandos. And we were trained together. And we were, well, at that stage, I was the fittest, fastest, strongest, biggest, probably smartest I've ever been in my life. So I, I was ready to give it everything I got. And that, that helped me get through selection, the knowledge that I've done everything possible. Also knowing that if I don't get selected, I'm quite happy to go back to commandos. You know, it's still a good life working and, and living with those guys. Yep. yep. That's interesting. The, um, you're now the second Nick I've had on the show. We had Nick Gill. Uh, not sure if you saw, he's the um, head strength and conditioning coach for the New Zealand All Blacks. Yep, yep, saw that. Won't mention the war. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, yeah the, now the second person, and me being the third, is who started their, their whole career with the Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. <laughs> well, he was the man. He still is the man in some, in some areas. Yeah, he really brought it to the public knowledge. Let's talk about commando selection and then roll into SASR. Um, how hard and what, were you, what are your thoughts looking back on commando selection was it? Yeah, to that stage, it was obviously... Uh, one of the hardest things or probably the hardest thing physically I've done in my life. Um, but it's one of those things where I, I had, a, had an attitude that, yes, I'm going to pass this because I, I saw the commandos as a stepping stone to get to the SAS. And, it, and realistically, it's not a stepping stone. It's a means to its own. It's a career in its own and a career in a very, very reputable, um, well-established um, unit. Uh, but at that stage, it wasn't a very mature unit. So they'd only just re-rolled a 4RAR, four, four which is an infantry battalion, into 4RAR commando to stand up full-time. So they became obviously now two commando uh, as it stands today. 
So at that stage for me, it was still in my head, like, I'm going to get through this. If I get through this, this will be a stepping stone for me to go to the SAS. So I had a lot invested in it, but I also had a lot of fallback um, in terms of, okay, if I don't pass, I'm going to go back to university and continue on with my plan and I'll have another crack later on uh, because it's still the SAS was still the goal. Now, um, it was, uh, it was, at that stage, it was a 10-day selection. And uh, I don't know how many people started. I would say probably about over 100 because you just saw the, the um, hoochie lines that we had set up outside and the, yeah. you know, where the selection course was held was just full of people. And after 10... Yep. You're saying just after uh, you had about 100 people starting just before you dropped out there? Yeah, and then, then we had a significant number. Um, obviously, at the significant lot, number had left by the end of the 10 days. And I don't know how many were left at the end of that 10 days, but we, when I started the Commando Basic Training course, which was the next course after selection finished, I think we had 16 on the course, um, three officers and 13 ORs. And that went, for about, that went for six weeks. And then the continuation training from then went for about uh, 12, 13 months. Um, and we, I don't think we lost anyone during that 12, 13 months from my Rio. Maybe one or two officers who actually qualified and then had to spear off to other areas or other responsibilities. Uh, so for me as a young bloke, that was, the, that was absolutely eye-opening experience. And I think that, and it, and, and it set the stage for me to understand what good was in that space, understanding how, what the mental model was like, how these people navigated, how these people thought, talked, walked, treated each other, all those sorts of things. And it was very, very, uh, very, very grounding experience for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm grew up, you know, relatively isolated, you know, on a, on a, in a farm, on a farm, mm -hmm. effectively. So the social, and to me, I was a very uh, introversial kid, pretty quiet kid as well. And so going into an environment like that, where you're surrounded by all these big, strong, tough men all the time, was like, uh, like, like the best thing ever at that stage for me. And you know, I look back in that period there; it was very formative for me. Yeah, so get, getting the commandos, you know, it was, it was, it was a, you know, the greatest thing to me, the greatest thing I've done in my life to that stage. And whilst when I got to the uh, battalion, battalion was effectively only comprised of one company. So Bravo Company for RER Commando yeah. was only one company of full time. But for all intents and purposes, that one company had a full out battalion's allocation of munitions, explosives, the whole box and dice. So when I got to the company, the exercise we were doing was they were pulling out all stops. You know, it was, it was, it was a boy's wonderland. It was training with all the toys you could possibly think of, um, all the assets you could ever want and more. And the training was continuous. It was, it was exactly as I expected training in special forces to be uh, and, and, and exceeded my expectation in, in that regard. But subsequent to that, um, probably the most, uh, arduous thing I'd done to that stage uh, wasn't selection. It was actually the commando amphib course, which is basically where we learned to operate in a maritime environment. I mean, mainly working out of F-470 Zodiacs and working around those transiting long transits in the open ocean to go to, to do exercises or to, you know, to, to, to train on targets or to hit training targets. Um, that 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 amount of time in the water, and I'm a surfer. I grew up surfing as well. That day, the armies tend to be able to wreck almost anything that, that you find enjoyable in your civilian life. Um, there was one course the army didn't wreck for me. I'll talk about it a little bit later. But the amphi course was was definitely one of the hardest. And you know, anyone who's worked in the ocean, especially when you're out there 24 seven, you know, you're 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 basically on your you know little rubber boat in the middle of the open ocean. And you're subject to all the conditions that the ocean can throw you. You know that was probably one of the hardest, the hardest thing I'd done, um, harder than the commando selection. Yeah, it's a real man maker. Uh, I mean, things go wrong in the water; it goes wrong quick and, and very, very bad, doesn't it? it does yep. Yeah. But good fun at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it, it is amazing being on the on the team. Um, you know, when, when I joined the team, just sit, and in our training cycle, um, watching. Um, the guys we were going to be taking over, how they operated, it was literally a, it was a, the sum is greater than the parts. The, the things they can get done is just amazing. So I can just imagine what it'd be like as a 19, 20, 20 year old um, uh, 
we would have thought growing up, but we think looking back now, kid, um, yeah. you know, very eye opening experience. What so you've, you've used it as a stepping stone, now you're looking at SASR. Talk us through your journey there, um, of selection and then going on to moving to Perth and moving your whole life again. Yeah, so, um, obviously, the commandos are posted in Sydney, and I was very lucky, you know, there's a high caliber of individual there as well. So those guys, being surrounded by those guys all the time was very formative for me as well. I still had that hunger to, to join the SAS because to me, at that point in my life, that was the epitome of service in the military anywhere in the world. Um, but, you know, often you take, sometimes it takes you, you have to look down to see what you have around you and to understand that you how good you've got it. So uh, I knew that was, I was having fun. I loved the commandos. I loved the hard work. I loved the courses that we were doing. I loved the guys that we were surrounded with. And still to this day, they're some of my best mates to this day. And this is, you know, 25 years later. Um, but there was always this desire to go there. And what further fueled that was there were guys in that unit who had actually failed SAS selection and chose to go and do commando selection or were after they'd done a sex selection course were basically they told them that you haven't passed SAS selection, but you can certainly try it and join the commandos. Yeah. And so it was a high, big number of those guys there. And there's also ex regiment guys who had subsequently left the military joined the reserves and decided they'll stay as reservists and they served as reservists in those in the commando units when we got deployed to Timor. So they further fueled the fire and seeing how they operate, seeing how they did just the basic stuff um, out bush, including you know, how we set up an LUP where, where a patrol comes in and sets up a firm base where they potentially could camp overnight or something like that. Just seeing how they operated was next level for me. And so I knew it just further instilled in my head that the place to go was the SAS. Um, so in every training activity I did in the unit, in the commandos, every training I did outside the uh, commandos, whether it's with my mates or on my own in the gym or whatever else, was always with that intent in mind to pass SAS selection. Uh, and it just so happens there was a number of other guys there who wanted to do the same thing. So like I said, my, my patrol when I was in recon snipers, um, commandos, we effectively all of us did SAS selection together and effectively all of us passed together. So having that crew to train with all the time was, was a massive enabler for me and a confidence builder for me. Yeah. I was also humbled a lot because a lot of these guys are much fitter, were much fitter than I am. and probably still actually one of them is another owner in this gym is much fitter than I am still. And he's older than me. But uh, there's always going to be those freaks there. And, and that line of excellence, that line where the next level is, is always creeping further and further away from you. And all we can do is just keep striving to try and touch that line or cross that line if we can. It's one of those things that we probably never will. And that was the environment I was in. And that was further reiterated when I got into the SAS and realized, oh, that for that line of that, that, that elite level or that, that next level for where I want to be is now just, just there. I'm going to keep working hard and try and get there and never, never get to it. It's like a carrot dangling from a stick. Um, so that, that was it. Joining the SAS was the goal. Um, all the training I did um, was with the intent to pass the SAS selection. And everyone I associated with was had that same intent in mind, pretty much. So uh, in 2001, for our commando was posted to, oh, sorry, did an operational tour in East Timor. And we did our rotation in uh, early 2000, or late, mid-2001. Mid and I had, it was great, it was great to do an operation, the first ever operation of any significance that I did uh, in recon snipers in a really good platoon with really good guys around me. And we did a lot of patrols and a lot of patrols where we'd spent days and days out bush just trying to be as sneaky as we can, you know, setting up OPs, watching you know, areas of interests for a long period of time. And that was a good basis and training for me, carrying a pack for a long period of time in arduous terrain, um, learning to have, be patient out bush, learning to be tactical and learning to be stealthy out bush. Um, all those things are very, very formative for me in terms of, well, this is an operational environment. This is what it feels like. And sure enough, fair enough, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, we weren't being contacted every day, if at all. Mm. But the, the, the intent, if I trained and worked with the intent that I'm always going to try and push to the next level, and to me, the next level is the SAS, then this is good basis for me. This is good training. So when we went on patrol, we'd be training together. When we came back from that operation, um, our hierarchy said, okay, you guys, I don't want to see you again. We, you guys, you got full remit to go and do whatever training you do. All I want to hear next is that you guys pass selection. And that, that was the environment we came from. And that's the, what our 
what our hierarchy enables us to do. So you couldn't ask for more perfect preparation to get to get paid basically to train and train to your own schedule and train for an outcome which everyone in the well, everyone that I surrounded myself with anyway supported that goal. And so to have that in the back of my mind, you know, it just further uh, instilled this um, feeling that we would be successful. It seems very organic. You know, I, I talked to a lot of different people about their journeys um, through to the special forces and different different units throughout the world. But it seems very organic the way you've done it. Um, uh, from the farm, literally your, your driven goal to join the military and it just sort of fell into place. But for those of the people listening, you know, that's through your drive. I want them, the people listening going, I sort of hand it to him a platter. And definitely not, because you've got to make that happen. And, uh, and, and luck is, is what you make it really. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, those environments, you're surrounded by guys like that and girls like that. You know, they, they've all got this intent. They've all got this drive to wherever it comes from to become better at whatever it is they did. And in that context, it's become a better, you know, even when you get to the SAS and you think you made it and you've got the beret, whatever it is, there's still another level. There's still a next level. And for me, uh, and for, in fact, 99.9% of the guys and girls we were surrounded with, that was the same intent just to get better. And whether it be as a person or an operator or both, whatever it was, the intent was always there is more I can do. There's I have more capacity. If I don't have it now, I'll build it. I'll get fitter. I'll get stronger. I'll get smarter. I'll, I'll train. I'll study. I'll do whatever it takes. You know, it's, there's points there where we would be, I'd be in my, in my small room, you know, on the lines and at the commandos and I'd have all my gear on in my room on my own with the door shut and I'd have a, a little toy gun practicing my drawers from my holster, little, little things like that. You know, that sort of to me was geeking out on the profession. But there are a number of examples of different guys and girls who would do the same, you know, you know nerdy um, activities and same nerdy pursuits to improve whatever it is they wanted to improve on. Yeah, I, I understand. I know exactly what you mean. Uh, that, and that draw, again, for those people listening, yeah, that may save your life or the life of someone else Absolutely. one day uh, when when you need it. You know, really what you're talking about there, and it's the same tenant, I know our tenant's the same from, from both New Zealand and, and Australia, the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. And it's just the way we're wired. And there's not many people like that. Um, that's why people seem... Um, not to be able to understand or comprehend people like us, that unrelenting pursuit of excellence. But it is there. Um, like I said, when I was talking with Nick, uh, Nick Gill last week, I didn't want to deject up. It was really tight on time. But um, I've got a, a story about that. In the, in the physical training or in PT, you know, we go out as unit PT or squadron PT. And uh, one day the PTI just uh, said, okay, guys, you've been training hard. We're just going to go for a 5K recovery run around the block. Just a cruisy run, okay? You've been training really hard. We're all like, yep, no problem. So we start off, and just one guy just wants to push himself. He doesn't want to push anybody else. It's fine, yeah. no problem. He's just doing his own thing. He's, so he's not competitive, but he's, wants, he's got a little bit of the unrelenting pursuit of excellence for himself. So he puts the hammer down for himself. And, of course, next thing you know, you got... 30 guys sprinting 5Ks around the block. Yeah, yeah, it's a very familiar story. <laughs> very competitive environment. And, and uh, you know, we, we, there seems to be some sort of methodology where they're trying to push kids away from competing and telling them it's not about competition, it's about participation. I think, uh, I mean, you know, we can, we can explore that subject more, but in that environment we came from, that, competi that comp competitive drive is what, Push the level to such a high extent. It's what gave those units, whether it be the New Zealand, Canadian, Australian, whoever else, it, what is what's pushed those units to the level that they are and were able to operate at. And there's no other. There's no other reason. Uh, there's no other driver for it other than the ability or the want to get better at everything we do and compete with our teammates appropriately. And uh, there, there's no argument in my mind. There's no argument against that methodology. No, it works really, really well. And uh, it's um, to be surrounded with those people is it's an honour, really. Um, and it's that's probably what I want to move on to next is your journey there because you're literally sitting in your, in one of your businesses there in, in the mill gym. You know, that's a transition from that high end. And I'm glad we've immersed the listener and the viewer into that. We've, we've really immersed them at that top tier. 
now suddenly that's not there, Nick. You've, you've chosen uh, to lead the military. It almost looks like our, our timelines are the same. I was in Timor in 2000. You left the military in 2008. So did I. Talk us through leaving the military, maybe the decision there, and then what's that look like now? Yeah, okay. Um, I guess I, I, I'm a planner. Like I like, I, I like to um, think ahead. I like to plan ahead. Uh, I love Excel spreadsheets. I love, you know, I love all that sort of stuff. If you looked at it, how many Excel spreadsheets on my desktop right now, you would be uh, amazed. You know, maybe you wouldn't. I don't know, but but it's one of those things. Like I, I, I like to plan everything. And it's not. And I, one thing I've learned throughout this whole process, it's not necessarily the plan because my plan has changed a number of times, and I, I feel them. I've gone completely one eighty. But if anything, it's the actual process of planning that has stood me to good stead. So um, even from 10 years old, I said, this is what I wanted to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And as I go through that process, I've learned that, okay, this, that's probably not worth my time doing Arnold Schwarzenegger's, you know, training protocol or, or program is not ideal for what I need to do. I need to get a pack on. I need to walk for as long as I can. And I need to run. I need to run as quickly as I can. Or, or at least build up my endurance and power endurance in running. So, uh, so that plan's changed a number of times. By the time I got to commandos, it was pretty close to where I wanted it to be. But by the time I did the SAS preparation, it was as best I could have it. It's taken all those years of experience of planning and I brought it to the fore where I passed first time every time, which is, which is the goal. Um, so when it came to, I said, well, when it came to the military, one thing I did see very early on the piece, in fact, I learned this before I joined the military and reading a lot of um, autobiographies by a number of ex-regiment SAS, 22, 22 guys, is that, it's a hundred percent in this career. Like it's all or nothing in order to be the best, like the gold medalist equivalent in any event, you have to put as much into it as you possibly can. I knew that was me. Like that, that was, there was no other way. It was either giving me a hundred percent or nothing. Cause if I gave it less than hundred percent and I didn't pass, or I didn't get selected, then I, there's only me to blame. Mm. So it's the same for everything for me. So it's the same, whether it be the military business or family, I knew that there would be conflict between military and family because I'd also seen examples like that amongst my cohort so when I looked at it I said okay I'm going to do 10 years and I'm going to give it the best 10 years I possibly can I'm going to take lessons out of that I'm going to set myself up to do whatever it was at that stage it was to actually leave the military and become a builder and and uh and then and go back to Queensland and surf and build um well probably more surfing than build hopefully but but then I realized that uh I needed to get as much as I could out of the military. And in order for me to get as much as I could, I had to put as much as I could into it. Because to me, that's the way it works. Yeah. And so I said, I'll do 10 years, get out after 10 years, start my own career and start a family. And that's effectively what I did. I did 12 years in the military, uh, but I set myself up to become a builder. Um, didn't get my builder's ticket. I was going to get that when I left the military. Um, but we'd been, me and a couple of my commando mates had been buying a number of houses since uh, 2000. And up to 2008, we traded about 23, 26 properties. Wow. Um, so that for me was the setup. That was me, for me the, 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 um, the confidence builder to say, okay, I can transition. But that doesn't mean the, con the transition was any more, didn't make it any easier because it was probably the most difficult period of my life you know, in, in that in, across all boards, it was contextually the hardest thing I'd ever done, regardless of selection, regardless of war, regardless of anything like that, because there was no safety net. Effectively, it was it was all on me. It was where, what we had done, uh, what we had built, what we were going to build, what we what we we're going to do. And so it was, it, and it wasn't just it wasn't just the 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 financial side. It was also the emotional side. It was also the personal identity side, which I had to get my head around. And I was no longer an operator. I was no longer able to do all this cool stuff and I wasn't, didn't have the safety net of a government job, uh, government leave, all that sort of thing that your crew was working in the military and all the cool people that you surround surrounded by, around all the time. Basically, I had to start from scratch and I had to um, take the same you know, drive that I had with trying to get into the SAS in the first place and use that to become an elite builder or whatever it was. Yeah. So... So, uh, oh, and going through a few, I had definitely had depression, definitely had anxiety, definitely had, um, I left with, you know, this really deep, um, super deep level of fatigue, you know, which I, you know, and it was later diagnosed with chronic fatigue oh, wow. and dealing with that as well, try, trying to make all that work and then trying to make a business work and then, you know, dealing with partners and 
you know, dealing with clients and all this sort of thing was, it was, it was definitely the hardest period of my life, but I still have this mentality. I still have this thought that there, we, I can do this. You know, I just got to get through this period. I don't know how long this period's going to last, but I, we can get through it. Like I, I've, I've, I've been to war. I've joined two of the elite military units in Australia, mate, potentially in the world. If I can do that, I can do anything. And, and I've, I've, yeah, well, here we are today. You know, this is now eleven years since leaving the military. We've been very, very fortunate to be um, have a, two businesses which I love. The people in it, I love, whether it be the clients, our, our employees, or our part-time staff, or my business partners, it is it is a um, it is definitely the culmination of all those experiences after forty six years of living on the planet. Where we've got to a point now where my lifestyle, my family. Uh, my business partners, my employees, our business uh, is where touch wood is, is the best I could possibly ask for at this point in time and, and, and very, very promising future. But that is because that, I think it's because that, that resilience that was developed through not only the military, because yeah, class in selection and going to war and all those sorts of things gives you a certain innate level, in, increases your resilience for sure. But it's that next phase, I think, was the, was the defining point for me. Transitioning out of the military, going through mental illness, going through all these experiences that were either imposed upon you or you set yourself up through due to mistakes you'd made, all those sorts of things. Um, the key is that you have this sense of faith in yourself and this sense of hope that everything's going to turn out well, but also understanding that you, if you surround yourself with the right people, like you said before, you're ability to contribute is exponentially multiplied like your ability to make things happen is exponentially multiplied by having the right people around you and i've been extremely lucky to have the right people around me whether it be my wife my business partners my our now and employees but also our clients they're, they're just good people i think you've summed it up in a really interesting way i really enjoy the way you answer answer questions um resilience was one you spoke about personal identity but you know, uh, DJ and, and Cole last week or a couple weeks ago on, uh, from GBRS were saying they're Americans, they speak a slightly different language. <laughs> that, you know, literally, what are you thinking when you, you get out of the military and you're one person? The whole time in the military, you never did anything, anything by yourself. You were part of a team, it'd be a two man team, four man team, whatever it is, squadron team. Yeah. Um, and now you're out and you're going to, you got to do it all by yourself. Now you spoke about your resilience that you, you had trained into yourself. Obviously the CEOs saw that in you and then it was, uh, it was, it was brought out uh, by training and, and operations. Um, but you've really nailed it. Your team, your wife, I mean, John McPhee, uh, Delta guy, he talked about you know, his, his wife kept insane um, that the boys were talking about the, um, the G various guys were talking about their team of, a couple of operators that went, went uh, in and out together. You've got to build that team. And, and I titled that, I think, build the team before you go. Coming back to your planning side of things, it's it's pretty clever. You knew you had the resilience to do it. You've now ended up with the end state of that team around you. You even said clients part of your team because it is what we, you and I, we, we enjoy teaching. We enjoy passing that, that knowledge on. Um, so that's really interesting. You, you talked about that. For, for me, I'm probably the same. I think that team approach gets you out of the hole doesn't it it does absolutely yeah i mean in the even the interactions every interaction you should be oh, my interaction with you when you came and did that our, our connect fighting um our package mm. you know all the people a lot of people that come due to do our kinetic fighting package um we've we've never met before now the way we set we set up the gym is we actually have an initial intro to those guys and girls and then we put them through the our initiation process and they've actually got to pass that before they can train with the general population in the gym. Mm -hmm. But with, with our Kinetic packages, we basically, it's all in sundry, you can come in. And, and um, so I'm meeting a broad array of people from all over our Perth. Um, and there's, like, I was absolutely surprised and also, not surprised, like, not, not, not to think that, that um, you weren't in the SAS. It was one of those things, like, wow, this guy was in the group over in New Zealand. I didn't know that. He's a pretty cool guy. And then he tells me this. You know, it makes sense when you say that to me, okay, this guy has something going on with this guy because he's, he's very similar to a lot of the guys I've worked with. And, when you, and, you, and there's always something you can learn by just watching people and trying to interact with them as best you possibly can and putting your best foot forward all the time. And you just never know where these things are going to pan out. 
I think if you go through the life uh, and your main purpose is whether they be a stranger, a family member or a lifelong friend, it's a case of respect everyone. You've got to give everyone the benefit of the doubt until they prove that they don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. You know, they're innocent until proven guilty. Um, so give them, give them that benefit of the doubt because that opens up your bandwidth. That gives you the ability to actually tune in with act, what they're actually trying to say when they say it or by their actions and those sorts of things and try to see it from as, 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 a, as mutually beneficial position as you possibly can until they, they prove otherwise, if they ever prove otherwise. So if that means that my team then uh, becomes those people who can give me, you know, when I say my clients, I mean, well, in our gym, our clients actually police our ethos and our, our operating systems more than we as owners or instructors have to do. Now, we're subject to our own ethos and um, guiding principles and standards and rules. Everyone else is. I mean, we have to fitness test every year. All our instructors have to fitness test every year. And we also have to pass to a minimum higher standard than the rest of the population. And if we do something wrong, we're subject to whatever punishment they deem is, is appropriate for the transgression. You know, and so that keeps it real for, for all of us. So I have absolute respect for our client base because they, they get what we were trying to say when we said, okay, not everyone gets in here. And to them, that bolsters that support for us even further to the point where these guys have got the keys. Like they can help themselves to the place. No worries at all. When the place is not open, you can, you've got the keys. You just help yourself in. And for me, effectively, it's a 24-hour gym for those guys and girls. And for me, that's the greatest, that the culture where you've got people where you trust innately, uh, and it's nearly everyone in the organisation, whether they be clients or, you know, employees, whatever, you've got a really good space. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the goal. No matter how much money you're earning or not earning, that to me is the, is the, is the prime, is the greatest thing we've, we've achieved so far. We're speaking, we're speaking about transition. And really, a lot of the things people find hard, especially general, it's probably both general army and, and, and special forces community, is speaking to civilians um, because they speak a different language. But you, you, you did sum it up there again, the, the way you, you, you answer those questions of um, let's just see that what that, you know, take that bandwidth, enlarge it, let them tell you, let them communicate, and, and hopefully you can see what is of value but um it does sound like you've transitioned to civilian oh. really, really well so let's you, you've called it a gym yeah you know, your, your gym is is a bit different than most so can we touch on um no i'm going to paint the picture It'd be better okay sweet <laughs> I, I a mutual friend of ours joe uh, i i think uh I, he was a co-founder with you back in the day so he was a new zealand army with me good lad Heard about you when I'm uh, the mill gym when I came to Perth uh, when I was in the police. Heard about this gym. You had to do a selection course to get into this this gym. Uh, I think you had a, almost the that 300 movie mentality behind it as well. It was, this is this is from the consumer. I thought yep. this must be something special. So that's that's my view of it. What what is the mill gym? What makes it different? And what what is this? Uh, how do you get in? Okay. Um, well, I mean. Uh, so the, the reference to 300 of the movie was, was basically not necessarily the movie, but it was actually the guy behind the training of the actors for the movie. So Mark Twight. So Mark Twight at that point in time, especially amongst the military and military contractor space was well known because basically Mark Twight was pushing a philosophy of training, which was counter to the popular culture of gym training. And subsequent to Mark Twight's uh, um, coming onto the scene, uh, whether it's chicken or the egg, the egg or the chicken, which way it was, but CrossFit became um, uh, popular. <clears throat> now, when we, military guys, I mean, at that point in our, so this, this is effectively 2006 onwards, um, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq have been going on for you know, at least five years, six years at that point. And so um, what happened was there was a whole bunch of military guys who were actually looking at the current uh, gym scene and going well that's not really applicable to what we do and that doesn't really assist us in doing our jobs better so when mark twight came on the scene and crossfit came on the scene it was actually a lot of the input in the early days was from sf guys you know t, t, high t t1 guys who had a genuine need to be physically hardy and physically tough not necessarily athletic or athletes but yeah. the ability to persevere regardless so um when those two 
processes or, or training methodologies came on. Everyone, a lot of military guys brought in, including myself. And Joe was one of those guys who was working in the contractor space at that time. And he went to Salt Lake City and actually trained with Mark Twight and the crew over there. And when he came back to Perth, he said, look, uh, I want to I want to start a a, um, a Jim Jones because that was the name of Jim's uh, yeah. Mark Twitch Jim at that point a Jim Jim Jones style gym uh, in Australia and I want it to be started and and backed and and uh, owned by um, SF guys and so he came to me and a number of other guys and I, I was just transitioning out of the military at that point in time I said you know worries yeah I'm I'm still going to go back to Queensland and become a builder but yeah you know, here's some here's my here's my cash. And until I go back over, uh, I'll, I'll help you out in the gym. And that's how effectively the gym started. So the way we'd set up the gym is we wanted to create an environment well where we could pick our friends, where we wouldn't train with morons. You know? We could really find find people who thought, acted, behaved, not in the way, necessarily in the way we did, but also but just got what we were trying to do. Yeah. And by the time uh, we, when we, by the time we'd set up, we had a number of people coming through, and we were do, putting them through our initiation process on our base uh, here at Swanbourne. And um, our first ever member who passed that process or that initiation is still a member to this day. Is actually one of my best mates, and he's now our multimedia guy. Um, he runs all our videos and photography stuff over here. Wow. And so this is this is what the, what's this? Thirteen years later, 12, 12, 12 11 years later. And, um, and, and there's been numerous examples of guys and girls who have joined this place and become lifelong friends. I've been best man at one of my, at our second ever members wedding about three or four years ago. And so it just goes to, so just an illustration of how tight this group is. And it's all because we said at the start that these are our standards and these stands, we have to not only walk the walk, we have to pass these standards ourselves, but we also expect everyone who wants to join this environment they have to pass those standards. And it's very much like, you know, SAS or commando environment where people get it, people will put themselves through this, this crucible to join a group of peers, a group of a cohort that thinks and operates or has the same life philosophy as we do, or very similar to. And that's spoke to enough to actually send us an email in the first place. Because when you look at our website, it's very foreboding. When we first set it up, it was very like... Um, Look, if you, you either like it or you don't, if you don't, then no worries, see you later. If you do, come on board. But you have to pass these standards. And those at the start for the first five years, it's brutal. Trying to find people, well, trying to speak to enough people who are fit enough to pass those initiation criteria, because um, still early days relatively for the internet. Mm. To find those people was took a long time. To get to where we were at capacity took us at least five years. To get us to the point where we were breaking even as a business took us five years. And we to that point, my wife and I put a lot into the business to, to get it to that stage. Um, but so glad we did. Like it was, it was uh, to, it's the it's the not only the lifestyle, but the people we are surrounded with on a day-to-day basis that make this um probably the you know, the second greatest thing I've done in my in my life, you know, regardless. You know. <laughs> um and so so it's 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 a um uh, it was it, it was a long journey. No, no doubts about it. When you, when you talk about small businesses, especially guys who had no experience in business, their, their minimum amount, limited amount of experience I had was working with my commando mates to buy these houses. And right up to 2010, we were buying houses. So we had, a, we had a, something to fall back on in terms of making sure we could put food on the table that, for us personally. Um, so we had that. And we had that experience of, okay, we've got to manage our money. We've got a plan. We've got to do this and that. We've got to understand how to finance it, all those sorts of things, shareholder agreements, all those sorts of things. So that put us in good stead. But actually doing a client-facing service where you actually have to win the trust of your client base um, was a different mindset, was a different approach. And it was very humbling. Uh, but um, once again, just another experience which I can put in the bank and and, and help to make the next line of you now operators, but now also entrepreneurs and hopefully business owners, uh, give them some stuff, give them some good solid tips to help them on their way. I love that we come full circle and it's also realism, 10 years to get a business to where it's starting to be successful. Um, but we come full circle to where we chatted before we started the hit, hit record and it was, you know, you talked about paying it forward. Uh, I call it knowledge transfer. Let's finish up on 
how you do that and and um, and what you've got going on. I, I think we're talking about um, is the urban operators course that you've got on. I'm not sure about the exact terminology, sorry, but you know, paying it back. You, like I said, you're not just a gym, and you're very humble to call it that. But I know you operate much more things. Uh, you know, we met on the kinetic fighting. That was was great. So people come along to you. They don't just come along to get some pecs, get some biceps, you know, you know, get some abs. They come to you for very different reasons, don't don't they? Yeah, they all have a functional reason. So they have a. So I'm not a gym junkie by any stretch, but I spent a lot of time in gyms because I had a goal which you know greater physical capacity would enable me. So when we look at that, well, biceps, uh, massive biceps aren't really functional unless you've got everything else covered. Um, but as you go through this process of becoming fitter, then you, you get biceps. You know? So it's just, a, it's just a byproduct of actually doing something. But the goal is an actual functional goal, which enables me greater capacity at whatever level I'm training, uh, I'm, I'm uh, trying to uh, operate at. So whether it be at a national or international level as a T1 Special Forces soldier, or as a mum or dad or whatever else. And they, they, I could argue that you know, the, the parenting is a far more important job than any other job. So if, if, we, if, if we put it out there that that is what we, that's the intent of this place, yes, we call ourselves a gym. And I think, you know, we are underselling ourselves because people go, oh, you're, you're in a gym and then the conversation stops. That's, that's cool with me. But what we're trying to offer is a service where everything we do is geared towards making sure that the next level of contributor contributes at a much higher level, has a higher capacity, um, has greater levels of resilience, and that just this you know, self-feeding circle keeps going of getting going to the next level, getting more resilient, being able to contribute at a higher, much higher level, all those sorts of things. So we've set up a physical space as a gym where there are weights, but also we offer courses in camps where we look to develop mental, physical uh, resilience as a complete package. And it's very much modelled on our experiences as Special Forces soldiers because that is quite a rigorous and robust process which we've all benefited from. So we've got to take those lessons and apply them to the civilian sector and the corporate sector in such a way that at least the main drivers, because not everyone's that physically hardy, but at least the main lessons that we can get out of that to the extent that we can teach them without putting them through those processes, um, we can in the best possible way. But that being said, we do offer a Carter camp, which is we basically replicate SAS or, or a special forces selection as far as we can with the assets that we have available in the physical space we have here. And as uh, special forces, ex or current serving special forces instructors working on that camp, our main goal is to get everyone in that camp to constantly ask themselves, why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? Or saying, questioning whether they can actually complete the process. Because if we can, the further and deeper we can put them in that box where they have to ask those questions on themselves, the more resilient they become should they persevere and overcome the, that situation or that environment that they're operating in. So it's up to us to make it as arduous as possible. It's not a fun camp by any stretch. It's not a, you know, we're not trying to make things cool or uh, entertaining. It's just grind and grind in the worst perceivable way. Uh, which is appropriate to what we're trying to get them prepared for. So that's that's at the one end of the spectrum. We've got the gym membership. We've also got the uh, the full immersion into special forces type selection. But we also run. We just started this new camp called the Urban Survival Camp, where we are taking our civilians and and immersing them into what it's like to operate in austere or hostile environments, giving them the tools to be able to navigate that environment. Uh, and to minimise the chance of something bad going on or to be able to mitigate an incident that occurs to ensure they survive, for one thing. But also give them the skills to understand how surveillance works, how, you know, how to work out whether they're being surveilled, surveilled once they get to a foreign country and maybe they're getting targeted for kidnapping or robbery or whatever else or extortion or whatever else. Or, so giving them the tools to be able to navigate that space and mitigate or minimise the effects should they be subject to it. Um, and on the flip side of it, we give an understanding of how SF teams work when they're doing recovery operations, when they're looking at finding where the hostage is and where, how we can do that to ensure that and how 
people who are navigate who are operating those environments have to conduct themselves to ensure that they increase the chance of being recovered should, should a situation like that arise. So it's all we're trying to jam as much as we can in 36 hours because you know people are very time poor and give them the benefit of all the knowledge we can in that space as we possibly can, but also make it um, to a certain extent um, super interesting, but also super pragmatic and super functional and giving them a lot of takeaways and values out of that and value out of that process. Looking at some of the testimonials, I mean, your, your Insta is, is awesome and, and is, I did some research before, I tried to do a little bit before each guest. And like the testimonials are phenomenal. You know, you've you've talked about, you know, literally simulating a special forces selection process. You talked about something that not many people are going to have to go through or consider, but there are people um, that are operating in austere environments or in, in a high threat environments. But what I got from those testimonials is even just from perhaps doing the um, uh, selection course to go to them to join the military and to passing a test and so on. It, it really seems to be that when you look into yourself. And you see something in there and you overcome that hurdle it gives these people that confidence it makes them a better person um i'm trying to paint the picture for that person listening because because i've been there i know what it's like to, to pass that thing and it, it, sh- it look, makes you look deep inside yourself and realize that you can step up you can overcome that hurdle and somehow nick that's what you bring the availability the environment for people to do that you know and it could be from the mum and you are on the same page there i'll come back to it to um a, a high-end ceo to someone trying to young young buck trying to get into the special forces but they all get something out of it and reading those testimonials was humbling um they were obviously very um they're, they're written from the heart and it, it did seem to make them better people and Kudos to you for, for providing that environment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's the same thing for us. It's very humbling to read those, uh, to read all those testimonials and get the feedback, even face to face feedback. has been been um, incredible. It's, it's another driver to say stay on path. You know, stay on this track, keep going, make what we do better, improve on it, even by one percent if we can. Uh, and then, yeah, and then it's, we're very fortunate to be surrounded by these people who just have just. They didn't need to buy in because effectively they got what we were talking about in the first place and, and they've been our most ardent supporters. And like I said, you know, a lot of them are our best mates and um, not only my business partners, you know, we, we, we spent, you know, most of our business partners I've known for 22 years you know, and they, they were with me from the start. And, they, and when you look at the amount of trust they put in you when they invest their money in you, you know, it, it's, it's humbling to know that they will continue to invest in you and they'll continue, whether it be money or time, and they'll, and they'll speak favorably about you and your business, you know, um, as long as, as long as they, as long as we continue to do a good job, um, that's, that's a real big reward, a real good payoff for us. Um, and we won't stop, you know, at, at this point in time, you know, we, we will we'll only offer one, there's only one more course because there's only so much time in a year which we can run camps. Um, so the urban survival is it, but now we just look back at it this next year as we go through into 2022, we're looking at making everything better. We're looking at making one percent better, and then can hopefully continuing getting the same feedback that we've been getting to this point. Yeah, you've you've got a great thing going. I'm I'm really um I want to say thank you for allowing me to share your story, and and hopefully I've I've asked the right questions to to really get that history of you and and then the mill gym itself and share it with everybody because um isn't it interesting the unknown is always thinking looking back at it as thinking out loud is. As we're talking, it's almost like the Miller Gym was like uh, SAS selection back in our day. Like you didn't, Absolutely. you didn't know much about it, and now we brought it out to everybody. So hopefully, I've done that justice. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean that, that's the that's the thing. It's no, it's no. Um, I mean, we 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 regularly tell everyone what the initiation standards here are here. You know, it's no mystery anymore. Uh, whereas it used to be a case of people would rock up with push them into the building and then lock the door and then we just keep them three hours and so the early days a lot of the guys passed initiation that's what they did they just did a three hour solid slog session and uh there is there is was minimal science behind it uh it was just basically this is the background we came from and this is what made this this is what you know at that point in our um career this is what made us who we are mm. uh but now there's there's a lot more uh rigor has gone into it to make it a more robust and repeatable and process where it's a level playing field for whoever wants to do the initiation test wherever you are in the world and we've regularly got people submitting their schools to us from anywhere in the world 
Oh, wow. That's awesome. Awesome. Worldwide. Look, Nick, um, thank you for your time. It's great to be able to share your story. I appreciate you coming on and look forward to catching up with you again. Great. Thanks, Damien. Absolute pleasure. Thanks very much. Nice one. Thank you.